I'm Wendy, I work at the Gawler Cancer Foundation. This is where we are. I'm the gardener here. It is a 40 acre property. We run retreats for people with illness issues, uh, predominantly cancer, but we also run retreats for people with MS and for people with Parkinson's. And we also run wellness retreats, so meditation retreats, dietary retreats time out, reset your compass, those sorts of things. Today I'd like to show you our property, or some of it. We'll start with going down to the river flats. We've got the Little Yarra River bordering our property. And then we'll make our way up through the ornamental gardens into the veggie garden, which is a one acre certified with NASA veggie garden. We grow the food to provide to the kitchen, which makes meals for the retreats. Uh, plant food, whole base, whole food based meals and when I show you the veggie garden I will be showing you some of the failures and successes that we have had in this interesting season and some of the issues that we've got up there as well as some of the good bits. So this is our river flats, this is the Little Yarra River. We're surrounded by manna gums there's freshwater cray, probably platypus, all sorts of critters all around us. And this is a beautiful, peaceful part of the property. A lot of participants come down here and just meditate quietly, spend some time reflecting. This is one of the special places on our property. While we try and keep some spaces grassy and sort of meadow-like for participants, we also try not to clean up too much. This is all part of the ecosystem. This sort of wood is habitat for so many creatures, most of them we can't even see. It's an important part of the recycling of the forest, of the cycle of life. It's, it's kind of the essence of organic gardening. It's that closed circle where nothing gets thrown away, nothing gets wasted, everything just changes its form. Our riparian indigenous herbage area jam-packed with a whole heap of things, some environmental weeds unfortunately, but a lot of beautiful native ground covers, herbs. We've got a uh, river pepper in here, which is a persicarius. Very hot, very good. I'm trying to get the kitchen to use it, although a lot of the participants here aren't good with really strong flavors. Uh, Lots of fireweed, we've got the hound's tongue all in flower at the moment, which is gorgeous. Beautiful, pretty little flowers, very delicate, very sticky leaves. Yeah, to a certain extent we let it go because nature just looks after itself. We do manage the environmental weeds. We've got some uh, honeysuckle, Japanese honeysuckle climbing up the trees and we get a grant from Melbourne Water to deal with that. It's an annual thing, it's a chip away, chip away. There's too much to do in one hit, but we do look after it. Uh, thistles I'll dig out at the beginning of each season, try not to let them go to seed. But mostly the bush just looks after itself. There's native raspberries all intertwined. We've got the prickly currant all through here. It's a place for teaching, it's a place for just healing and just to be. This is our newly built teaching space shed, for want of a better name. It's really exciting to have this space. We run one day garden to kitchen workshops here and half a day in the garden learning about how to grow organic food and the other half a day in the kitchen with the head chef Stacy teaching you about whole food, plant-based diet and cooking with legumes and all that sort of stuff. And we have a beautiful lunch to share. And this is our home garden, which is a, like a demonstration veggie patch because our main growing space are big 20 metre rows and that's not inspiring to someone who wants to just start a little home garden. So we've created an example home garden here. It's not in the best condition right now, but it's a beautiful space and it's much more inspiring and comfortable for people to look at. So teaching people to garden organically is one of the highlights of my job. I really, really enjoy it, more than I thought I would. Uh, teaching them about that cycle of life, the, 
that what you put into the soil is what goes into the food, which is what goes into the body, and it's all about health, soil health. Without soil health, your plants aren't going to be healthy, and then the food you get is not going to be ideal. I love switching people onto that and watching the moment when all of a sudden they get it. I also love taking away the mystery and taking away the sense of there's rules that I have to live by. So one of the things that I really enjoy doing is constantly telling people there's no rules. There's no rules. What's the worst that can happen? Something dies, plant another one, let it go to seed, collect the seed. Learn from the plants, pay attention, check them out every day, watch where the new growth comes from, watch the fruit ripen. A lot of the people who come here haven't gardened before, so the blast that I get from watching them walk away thinking, I can do this, I can give this a crack. This is not that hard. That's awesome. This is our yacon or Peruvian ground apple crop. It's in the sunflower family, so it's gonna have some tiny little yellow flowers. Usually it's a bit bigger than this. Uh, the leaves are a really interesting shape. And a lot of people think it's uh, J uh, Jerusalem artichoke, which it isn't, and it's much, much nicer. So under the ground, when all of these plants have died off and gone to brown, we'll cut them back and dig up the crowns, which have got, they look a bit like sweet potatoes, and they're big, juicy tubers, and they're very sweet. They're really, really yummy. Not a lot of people know about them. And I've got lots to share if you want them. Uh, but they've got a lot of inulin in them, which is a particular sort of sugar. So it's apparently very good for diabetics, but not good for people with fructose issues or intolerances. But they're a, they're a great talking point. They're a fun crop to grow. They don't get harvested until June when the rest of the patch is quiet. Yakon. So these are the two tools that we use mostly. We have the broad fork, which is a beautiful old piece of equipment that goes into the soil and gets put fairly deep. You climb right into it to use it and then you just rock it back. Rock it back forward and slide it out and do it again. And you can change how much you disrupt the soil by how far apart you put each stroke if you like. I feel connected to centuries of farmers when I do this. I really enjoy it. Very peaceful, very meditative. This is done in between every crop but once a year we'll use the spader or the walk behind tractor with the spader implement to plow in or to dig in the green manure crop. So we'll do a green manure crop once a year. We've got a flail mower attachment for this which just like a mulcher mower and then we'll swap the head and it'll dig it all in and this thing can do in about 15 minutes what would take me more than a week to just dig all that green mulch in let it sit for a couple of weeks and then you're good to plant but in between times when we're ready for another crop but I don't want to use this again because it's quite even though it's the most gentle it's much better than a rotary hoe it's still fairly destructive to the soil structure and you're improving the structure by putting in the green manure, but I don't like doing it too often. So in between times we use this, because this is divine. This field is one of our prime real estate fields, was. It got a small nutgrass infestation and we tried to solarize it. It was too tough for that. We tried a number of different things, black plastic as well, didn't make any impact. Because we compost and irrigate, we provided the ideal situation or conditions for the nutgrass. So within one season, we lost half the field to it. By the second year, we'd lost the whole field to it. And that was with attempts at hand digging it. So I've given up on this space for ground level crops. So we've put lemons in it because the nutgrass won't impact on the lemon trees. And you can see where the lemon trees are. So that area the nutgrass is still thriving but the rest of it now we can just mow it so at least it doesn't flower. This is a lovely specimen of our nutgrass also known as umbrella sedge or drain sedge, flat drain sedge I think too. 
some gorgeous heads on it. Apparently when it sets seed, which we try never to let it do, it, the seeds are viable for over 20 years. It is known as one of the worst agricultural weeds in the country. It also spreads via a really extensive root system. A lot of those have been snapped off here, but it's often bigger. Roots are pink on our species and nuts that are hard like a raw chickpea, often bigger than that. One nut will grow a grass and then throw out another, I don't know, 20 nuts in a few weeks. It spreads prolifically very quickly. The only way I know how to deal with it is dig it up by hand. And often the roots are like spread out fairly flat, but the nut will be on a much different coloured root, like more brown, much more tenuous, all the way down, quite deep. So it's easy to weed it out, but it's even easier to leave the nut behind. We're in our asparagus forest, which I'm very proud of. And in front of me is the comfrey, row of comfrey. Now we don't eat this, but because we're on a slope and we are in a water catchment, the comfrey is very deep rooted. So it's known as a bioaccumulator and it will, we hope, pick up all the excess nutrients that the veggies behind me don't use. So the leaves are like gardener's gold. We use them in the compost, cut them all back, take it all up the hill and compost it and have that constant rotation of nutrients. We'll also use it to mulch the tomatoes and the eggplants and the capsicums and the things in the polytunnel each year. And for me, that whole, the cycling of nutrients is really important. And also that sense of responsibility to the water catchment. I don't want all our excess nitrogen and other minerals just going off into the Little Yarra River. That's not what we want to do. So it's this cycle that we've got. Feed it up there, dribbles down here, comfrey picks it up. We can make a fertiliser out of comfrey. It activates the compost as well as adding a heap of good nutrients to it. This is gardener's gold. This is our garlic patch. This is really special. I've decided I want to be a garlic farmer. This is our winter crop, our main winter crop. I would like to provide the kitchen with a whole year's garlic supply, which we do, but this year we're doing a different sort of garlic as well as the normal ones so that we can have a longer keeper garlic. So we've bought some Creole garlics this year as well as our normal ones, which is just a purple that is ready to sprout by April already. So we've got 1,600 cloves of garlic in here and I'm hoping that in November we can harvest at least 1,500. Lots of soil preparations gone in. We've used a spader on a walk behind tractor so the soil's very loosened and then I've put very deep homemade compost from us. And then I've actually mulched it with wood mulch which is not ideal perhaps but because the compost is so thick it doesn't impact negatively on the garlic at all and weed management for garlic is critical so that's the method we're using at the moment. It needs to be netted because the cockatoos come through and snap the leaves off. They don't want to eat it, they just want to snap it and play. So here's our babies. They've all gone in in April. A little bit at the end of March and mostly in April because it was important that they did some growing in the warm before it got too cold. So they're actually up, sprouted, happening, and then it'll get cold and they'll just sort of go into a holding pattern really. They'll grow a bit over the winter, but hardly. And then in spring, even by August, they'll be starting to grow again as soon as the warmth comes back through. And we will liquid fertilize them with a certified fertilizer every couple of weeks right through their growing period until probably sometime in October to get the biggest bulbs we can because then the chef loves us. All right, so my method is, getting lazier and lazier. Um, I used to spend a lot of time lining carefully with torn up right shape compost, uh, cardboard boxes. I've got a lot of boxes and not a lot of time. So I throw a box in, that covers the wire. I'll fill the box with my next bucket of compost. I've even hit the point where I no longer take all the rubber bands off my herb bunches. I'll find them later. 
We've got 12 bays and it is the heart and soul of an organic veggie garden. It's the cycle of life. This is where the nutrients get cooked over and like an, a process of alchemy and turned back into an amazing product that goes back into our gardens. We don't run a veggie row without recomposting before we put the new crop in. And you can probably notice we've got pak choys, tomatoes, pumpkins, weeds everywhere. It's all part of diversity. It's all part of nature and an ecosystem that just all looks after itself. We don't have pest issues. We don't, it just looks after itself. It's brilliant. So all the frames were donated to us and they're better than chicken wire because they don't bulge because as compost drops down, the chicken wire bulge terribly. However, the holes are a little bit big. So that's why all the cardboard and I just use our scrap cardboard and what doesn't break down gets thrown into the next card, uh, compost heap. So we've just got this ongoing process. At the moment, I'm waiting for these ones to get finished. And now that it's getting colder, that'll take longer. But we have pumped through so much compost this season. All the garlic is in thick compost made by us, which is from our food that goes to the kitchen. The kitchen makes the meals. We get big buckets of compost, come back up the hill, start the whole process again. This is our polytunnel. In winter, it's very important. It's not heated and it doesn't really protect from the cold, but it does protect from the frost. So this is the only place I can grow lettuce over the winter period. At the moment, I've just got in a heap of kale seedlings, so hence the insect netting, so that the white cabbage butterfly doesn't eat them before they grow. Um, yeah, this is a beautiful space. We grow tomatoes in here as well as outside to hedge our bets, because usually one of them's not looking great at any given point. That's the summer crop. We've started just putting random herbs in just because I like them and they're pretty and they bring more insects in. I try and leave the doors open for as long as possible just because of that interaction of nature. I don't like having it as a locked up system. Whitefly can get out of control very quickly in here. So the more airflow and birds and at the moment kangaroos, rabbits, it's just, it's just a covered outdoor area. We're transitional at the moment. So the cucumbers are just finishing and there's a couple of whopper cucumbers that I'm leaving for as long as possible to get the seed from. That's next year's seed. Lots of parsley gone to seed. Tail end of the tomatoes. Tail end of the silver beet looking better than it's ever been. Lots of coriander finally. Comfrey at the end of each bed. Same reason as outside, just it's all on a slope, it catches all the nutrients and then it just gets pushed back up the hill. And we grow all our own seedlings here from mainly our own collected seeds. So the tables at the bottom are the new seedlings or seeds planted, ready for the next batch of planting. Thanks for watching, thanks for paying attention. I'm glad that you came and had a look at the space. I'd love for you to come and meet this space in person. I would love to chat to anyone about this space and the issues we face and the, the challenges of organic growing. Yeah, it's still a pleasure no matter how hard it gets. Look, one of the wonderful things about uh, Wendy's garden here is that uh, it basically it's on the Gawler Foundation land. We're dealing here with the healthy aspects of people and therefore what you want with healthy people is to have healthy food. The foundations of organic agriculture actually came from the early pioneers of that and these were people such as McCarrison that did nutritional studies in India, from Picton who was a medical practitioner in the United Kingdom, through the agronomists Halbert and Auer. These were historical figures that said the only way to grow healthy food was to have healthy soil. To bring it up to date now, one of the latest peer-reviewed journals is basically the Lancet Journal of Planetary Health. It's talking about the importance of getting the quality of the soil right, the healthy soil from healthy ecosystems to basically make a healthy world. So they're embracing it not just at a level of an organic farm but taking it into much wider ecosystems across the world. Fantastic experience we've had at Wendy's Farm and we're most grateful to have been here. Mm -hmm.